Shrek fan? Yeah. Yeah. You ever went Shrek was in a band? I saw this video. I was in the cabinet once. The ears started coming and they would stop going. And I was like, oh, you know. Yeah. It's funny that they're back. They probably, they, they probably get tired of having a few songs. Right. Got to reach. I feel like I can probably, it's like you can retire to like, what do you know? Not, not play your one song? Show off, hang out at home? Find your hobby? Make a book? Where do you think you decide to find your culture? Oh, yeah. Right. But not in a vacuum. Not for me. I guess Could you stop there on the military technology? You could have just stopped there on the we're digital brands. Digital brands. Um, it's, it's, it's a, it's a friend.
All right, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, to the SSP Wednesday seminar. I'm Taylor Fable, director of uh, the MIT Security Studies Program. I'm delighted, a little bit sad, but maybe still mostly delighted, at least given where we are in the academic calendar, to say this is our last seminar uh, of the season, um, of the academic year. Uh, we're we're going to go out with a bang and not a whimper. Uh, but before proceeding and introducing today's speaker, I wanted to thank uh, Andrew and Chris and Laura and everyone else uh, at uh, on, on the MIT SSB admin side for making these seminars possible, for making them possible on, on the intertubes, uh, on YouTube and everywhere else. Uh, so it's greatly appreciated what uh, all, all you guys have done. And I can see that um, uh, you're still uh, not out of the woods yet with our last seminar, but a big round of applause to Andrew and Chris. Um, uh, secondly, just for the, the MIT uh, folks in the room, um, I am beginning to think about the makeup of the seminar for next year. I'm going to send an email out shortly asking for uh, suggestions of speakers. Um, I get a lot more suggestions than I can accommodate, but I really appreciate all of them. Uh, so please do uh, let me know uh, who you'd like to hear from, um, a little bit about sort of why I think they might be a good speaker for the seminar, so watch out for that email. Um, um, and again, uh, I know some of you have suggested uh, folks in the past, and I haven't always been able to accommodate them, but it's tremendously useful to get a sense of what people are interested in And as, as I kind of put together uh, the roster. So uh, today, I'm really uh, delighted to welcome uh, John Bateman from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He's a senior fellow in their Technology and International Affairs program. His focus areas include techno-nationalism, cyber operations, and influence operations. He's the author of a terrific report, U.S.-China Technological Decoupling, a Strategy and Policy Framework. He previously served uh, in the U.S. government in a variety of roles. Uh, first, a special assistant to uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford, as director for cyber strategy implementation in the office of the Secretary of Defense, and as a senior intelligence analyst at the Defense Intelligence Agency. Uh, his commentary has appeared in many different places, including the Wall Street Journal, Politico, Harvard Business Review, Foreign Policy, Foreign Affairs, and I could go on. Uh, he's a graduate of Harvard Law School, where he received his uh, JD, and uh, also a graduate of uh, Johns Hopkins uh, University, where he received his bachelor's degree. Today, he's going to talk about uh, U.S.-China technological decoupling. John, welcome to MIT. Thank you. <laughs> Um, well, thanks so much for that warm introduction. It's absolutely a pleasure to be here and uh, close out what uh, I've heard has been a terrific speaker series. Um, wonderful to be back in Cambridge um, and just delighted to be in a university setting. Uh, it's just such exciting just feeling the intellectual ferment and seeing all the posters up on the poster board. And uh, of course, I'm very overdressed coming from Washington, DC, so you'll have to forgive me for that. Um, so what I wanted to talk about today is this amorphous concept of technological decoupling. 
um, focused on the United States and China. Um, and uh, especially since we're at a university, I think it would be good to start with some definitions and caveats, but that's how I always like to start this conversation. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about the United States and China, but of course, this is not a dyadic relationship. It's a very multifarious world in which many uh, governments and companies are involved, um, multinational, national. Um, so it's bigger than just the United States and China. And in many ways, the United States and China are what I like to think of, the, the, maybe the, the metaphor is kind of a global technological web in which the United States and China are the two largest naughty masses in this web. And what's happening in a way is a severing of some of the links between these two countries, which of course has implications for many other countries and actors. Now the term decoupling itself is rather contested and I use the term uh, with apologies in quotation marks. Uh, it's sometimes it's a term of abuse. Uh, the United States government frequently says that we are not seeking decoupling and instead accuses the Chinese government of seeking decoupling. The Chinese government says something rather similar. Uh, so what it really does this term mean? It lacks clear definition, and I think that's often what makes it easy for an actor like the U.S. government to say that we're not doing it, but someone else is. Uh, decoupling sometimes connotes a full break, a total economic and technological divorce, and that's not what I mean by the term. Uh, what I mean instead is something more partial and iterative, a phased reduction of interdependence. It's as simple as that. Um, so we think about the US and China being very technologically interdependent in many different ways, um, from raw materials, people, know-how, data, financing, and finished technology goods and services. All of these things are constantly flowing between the two countries at the finished and intermediate level and amongst other countries that are part of this shared global marketplace and supply chain. Technological decoupling means that those links are being reduced in some form or fashion. So what's driving this? My argument is that US policy is the primary proximate driver of technological decoupling. Now, again, this needs to be stated with caution. Uh, the Chinese government also has important decoupling policies, uh, and many other companies and governments are also at play here. Um, but when I say proximate driver, I mean that the current wave of decoupling that kind of really crested in the last five or 10 years, I think was initiated and catalyzed by US government actions. And other actors have really been in a position of responding or reacting in many ways. Um, so you could trace this story, of course, quite far back, even to the 1970s, when the US and China formed official diplomatic relations and started to build economic ties. And, and we all know that in the decades that followed, a tremendous uh, synergy was developed, the so-called Chimerica um, you know, economic synergy between the two countries. Um, and, and this can be described in many different ways. Uh, China has become the, the top source of uh, imported goods for the United States, uh, the top source of international students for the United States. Uh, the U.S. is the top destination for Chinese exports um, and also the most important um, financial partner for China. If you look deeper in the technological realm, there's so many thick links. Uh, China sends more STEM PhD students to the United States than any other country. Um, it's second only to India as a source of foreign STEM workers and high-skilled H-1B uh, visa holders. Um, if you think about specific industries like semiconductors, uh, a lot of people may not know that one-third of the revenue from the U.S. semiconductor industry comes from China. Uh, obviously, it's well known that companies like Apple and Tesla have used China as a critical manufacturing hub. Um, and there's many scientific cooperations as well. Um, Chinese and American scientists author more joint papers together than any other single country pair. So there's been this massive synergy that's developed over many decades. Um, it's also important, though, to recognize that there was never a full coupling. There always were restraints and limitations on this technological relationship. Uh, famous ones on the Chinese side include, of course, China's great firewall at the content layer of the internet and also many market access restrictions on the ability of US tech companies to operate there. At the same time, on the US side, we've always had things like export controls, for example, uh, targeting military end uses and end users in China. So there's never been a full and free flow of technology, goods, services, or inputs between the two countries and considering intermediate countries as well. 
Uh, but nevertheless, the significant, uh, the interdependence was incredibly significant and, and the trajectory was toward more and more. And so when I refer to technological decoupling, I'm really referring to a complex phenomenon that really took hold about 10 years ago and has accelerated in the last five years. Uh, and I think there's really two fundamental strategic drivers of this, if we think about um, specifically the US side of this. Uh, the first is obviously the deterioration in US-China relations across every conceivable dimension, uh, everything from the militarization of the South China Sea, um, increased authoritarianism in China, uh, greater predation on Hong Kong and, and uh, threats toward Taiwan, uh, the horrific abuses in Xinjiang, increased Chinese economic coercion of its neighbors and trading partners, and unfair trade practices from China, including IP theft. This, of course, is a longstanding concern, but it crested in terms of its importance to U.S. policymakers as China moved up the value chain. You know, it's one thing if China is stealing intellectual property to make television screens. It's another if there's a sense that it's doing so to make leading edge technologies such as 5G telecommunications manufacturing, um, artificial intelligence and the like. So that's one big strategic driver of this decoupling process is uh, the state of US-China relations. Uh, but the, I think the other process that also has took hold in the US intellectually is this embracing of notions of techno-nationalism. And I think sometimes it's jarring to remember just how far we've come in a very short period of time. I think throughout living memory, the US has probably been the world's leading proponent of technological globalization. Uh, if you think about the massive technology footprint that the US has around the world in terms of our tech companies being in other countries, gathering data, bringing revenue back to the United States, establishing extraordinary multilateral and multinational footprints. It's huge benefits to the United States. It's been called a golden age of signals intelligence because of our ability to tap these companies. Uh, we've created massive companies in many different industries and there was this kind of brand America sensibility as we were uh, tech platforms like you know, Facebook and Google were actually projecting US values around the world. So often the US was kind of in the push side of this digital globalization. But I think a sense developed over time that actually technology was also a vulnerability to the United States. A wave of cyber operations, um, IP theft, disinformation in the 2016 election, these were all very frightening to US policymakers and gradually created a sense that perhaps the US actually has more to lose than we appreciated from a sense of digital openness and open competition. Um, there also was this growing recognition that a new wave of strategic technologies was on the horizon particularly 5G and artificial intelligence, or I think perhaps the most hyped of this new wave of technologies. And that for the first time, strategic competitors like China could actually be leading, potentially dominating in these areas. And so again, a sense has developed that between a growing techno-nationalism and a deteriorating US-China relationship, that perhaps digital globalization and openness was no longer working for the United States. And this really eroded the strategic bargain on which so much technological engagement between the United States and China had been based. Um, I think it would be fair to say now that there's a sense in Washington, D.C. that technology is at the center of U.S.-China strategic competition. It pervades absolutely every friction point that we have in grievance with China. And a lot of policymakers seem to believe that technological leadership could actually be a determining factor in what happens in military economic, political, and diplomatic competition. So what have we seen from this in terms of US policy? Uh, I try to make the distinction between defense and offense, or what's sometimes called um, slowing down the other side versus running faster yourself. Uh, most of the action in Washington has been on the defensive side. Um, so trade restrictions like export controls and tariffs. Um, investment controls on both inbound and outbound investment, specifically in technology industries. Visa restrictions on Chinese students coming to the United States if there's uh, purported affiliation with civil military uh, fusion. Uh, law enforcement campaigns like the so-called China Initiative, which still endures in, under different banners. Um, massive federal procurement and use restrictions on uh, technology either used by the federal government or funded by the federal government. In each of these areas, there's been a policy revolution. Old tools have been used much more intensively and also in qualitatively new ways. And new tools have been created for the first time. 
Um, so actually an important kind of side story here is the agglomeration and growth of the US national security state and its increased importance in economic and technological affairs. Uh, the lawyer in me is quite startled by the degree to which all of this has required virtually no input from Congress. And the executive branch has essentially of its choosing. So that's on the defensive side. What about the offensive side? What about running faster? Americans' own efforts to, to build resilience, strength, leadership, and perhaps lower our dependence on China. Well, that's been much slower off the mark, uh, relatively marginal efforts during the Trump administration, but these have greatly accelerated under the Biden administration with the Chips and Science Act and the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, tens of billions of dollars have been allocated to catalyze uh, industries like semiconductor fabrication um, and electric vehicle um, uh, uh, design and manufacture. I think it's worth pausing here to ask, what's it all for? What are the policy objectives? Because I think sometimes it can be taken for granted and rolled up into this vague framing of national security or economic security. Um, and I think many people have stopped asking the question about what sub-goals fall within those capacious categories. And there's this unfortunate quality in the debate in Washington where the invocation of terms like national security and economic security are often seen as argument enders rather than conversation starters. Because actually there's a lot going on within those categories that really needs to be debated and decomposed and there's many important trade-offs. Um, in my work, I've cataloged at least nine different policy goals that I believe the US has in this effort. Some of them fall under the national security banner, um, maintaining a military edge over China, uh, making sure that we have the best military technology. Um, stopping Chinese national security espionage, so their theft of our national security secrets. Preventing Chinese sabotage in a crisis, making sure that in some kind of war or conflict or crisis situation, they couldn't use technological influence in the United States or allied countries to subvert our response. There's also concern about influence operations and, and disinformation, uh, often exemplified by the rise of TikTok. And there are these concerns about a, a digital authoritarianism and human rights in China and the supposed export of this around the world. So those are at least five different goals right there. That's just in the national security realm. Then if you step into the economic realm, there's still more to unpack. Uh, we often frame our economic concerns about China with respect to unfair competition. And that's a really significant concern in terms of opaque subsidies, uh, discriminatory regulation, IP theft. But that's not all there is to it. If China were to stop all of these practices tomorrow and exist on what we define as, and China has agreed to as a level playing field, WTO rules, US law, they would still represent the greatest competitive challenge to US tech leadership in decades. And so there's still a distinct concern there about the US uh, perhaps feeling that its leadership in strategic industries is at risk regardless of unfair economic practices. But those two are often blended together. And then finally, um, since we're talking about Washington DC, we have to account for what I call ancillary objectives, things that are not strictly speaking about technology but ways in which tech can be brought into some larger game that's being played. Uh, one of those games is simply the effort to get leverage over China that could be used in any number of ways. Um, a classic example of this was when President Trump seemed to put forward the fate of Huawei and ZTE as perhaps part of the phase one trade negotiations. Um, and there's, there's just a lot of uh, domestic political gamesmanship that's happening as well. That's really a key and distinct objective for many leading figures in the United States. So I've talked a lot so far about the US thinking and policy response. Uh, what about everyone else? Surely this is not all a US story, um, and it's not. But I do believe that there is no other governmental or corporate actor that is pushing as hard as the US government is doing in this direction of technological decoupling. Um, so our allies, uh, European governments, Asian governments, my sense in you know, talking to these people is that there's a roughly shared threat perception in many ways, sometimes a bit less intense, sometimes a bit more intense. Um, but nevertheless, there's a desire to 
be more moderate and conciliatory in the policy options chosen. So we've seen a similar direction shift. Um, the UK, for the first time, has put in place um, an investment screening tool. Uh, Japan and the Dutch have followed us in terms of export controls on semiconductor manufacturing equipment. So we're seeing movements directionally here and there. But inevitably, they are more partial, and they follow what the US government is doing. Um, it's never with the same enthusiasm um, or comprehensiveness. Um, and I think many allies would probably prefer to conserve more aspects of the status quo and maybe see themselves as a moderating force in this policy conversation. I would say the same is true of uh, Western and multinational tech companies and other companies. Um, publicly, uh, they will say that we are here to support national security. And of course, any targeted measure is you know, necessary and you know, relevant, and we will fall behind it. Um, but I think the reality is that lots of corporations would prefer to make their own risk assessments. Um, and there's a sense for many corporations that although the business environment is significantly deteriorating in China and there's a need to de-risk and diversify over time, um, that many businesses believe that they can more safely operate even in this increasingly complicated environment than the US government believes. So again, corporations are kind of following, but I think more slowly than the US government is. And then there's China itself. Uh, China obviously gets a huge vote in this discussion. Their policies are incredibly influential. It's been remarkable that during this whole array of US activities targeting China, the Chinese response in terms of tit-for-tat retaliation has been very limited, almost quiescent. Um, there have been a few things here and there, um, mostly designed to show strength or project some kind of deterrence or face saving, but never as significant or powerful as the initial US blow that provoked that response. Uh, so of course, many of you all will be familiar with the entity list. This is the major company specific targeted export control that the US has. It's our kind of go-to sanctions tool now. In response to that, China has created something called the unreliable entities list with even the nomenclature clearly is meant to evoke some kind of symmetrical response. And the unreliable entity list could actually be used even more broadly. It's a kind of all-encompassing tool that includes more than just export controls. But China has not actually used this list. No US company has been placed on this list. So it's more of a threat um, and a kind of modest shift in this direction. Um, China has also put in place other broadening export control regimes, um, again, for the first time, but still is not deploying them as aggressively. Uh, but there is an important interactive effect between the two countries' policies. There was actually a vivid example of this just in the last few days when there's been reports of increasing Chinese law enforcement crackdown on consultancies and due diligence firms operating within China. There's a fear that the Chinese government has that these firms are essentially providing national security or economic security sensitive information to Western corporations and ultimately to governments and enabling investors and businesses around the world to uh, implement US policies like the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act um, and other forms of uh, decoupling and de-risking that China does not want. So China is responding to these US and Western policies by implementing its own crackdown on information provision moving from China to Western due diligence firms. This, of course, will accelerate the cycle of decoupling further. So there's an aspect of interactivity there. Um, I've been painting this stark picture of this shift toward technological decoupling. I want to say a word about what tangible results we've seen in the world so far. And I want to be clear that everything that I'm describing up until now is a directional shift, not necessarily a wholesale sea change in the actual economic and technological relationship on the ground just yet. Uh, the effects so far have been largely confined to select areas and industries, not the overall macroeconomic trade relationship, but some of these are significant. Um, so I'll just rally off a few statistics for you. Um, after the Trump tariffs were put in place on China, um, there was 
a dip in US-China trade across the border. That's now recovered. So you'll hear people say, well, there really is no decoupling because US-China trade is now at its highest levels ever. But if you look below the macro level at specific sectors, such as the IT hardware and consumer electronics category, there's been a 62% decline in US imports uh, from, uh, 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 from China under the tariffs, including a 26% decline in Chinese semiconductors being imported. Um, you could tell similar stories about other strategic sectors. Uh, solar panels, for example, have been massively affected by tariffs and by the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And so as a consequence, it's been reported that 1,000 shipments of solar panels worth hundreds of millions of dollars have been seized by the U.S. government and are sitting at U.S. ports. And this is expected to contribute to a 23% decline in U.S. installations of solar panels in the coming year. Um, other well-known examples include uh, STEM researchers and graduate students. You all will be familiar with the visa re restrictions on military and civil fusion. Um, so what we know is that uh, more than 1,000 Chinese researchers unexpectedly left the United States um, after uh, the visa ban and some of the investigations were unveiled by the Department of Justice. And about 2,000 Chinese academic visas were revoked or denied around 2020. Uh, we also can surmise that thousands of others have probably been chilled from applying or um, for positions in the United States, but this is something you all will know even better than I. Uh, than I. And then finally, in the area of financing, uh, CFIUS, the Committee on Foreign Investment in the United States, a very powerful tool for restricting inbound investment from foreign actors in the United States and in sensitive industries, um, has been greatly empowered in terms of its jurisdiction and the resources available to it. So a lot more needs to be reported to CFIUS now, and CFIUS is much more active in blocking China-related uh, transactions, specifically in tech sectors. In part as a result of that, there's been a 71% decline in the notices being filed to CFIUS of Chinese acquisitions of US firms from 2018 to 2021, 71% decline. Now, during that same period, CFIUS notices from other countries from, uh, basically remain stable. So this was a China-specific result. It's not wholly due to CFIUS. Um, there have been other de uh, broader declines, even in uh, Chinese passive investment in the United States, but CFIUS was a major factor. So those are some of the most, I think, significant real-world effects that we've seen so far. Um, and I'm avoiding talking about some of the more obvious things like semiconductors and telecommunications equipment. Um, in other areas, we still see stability and even growth in the US-China technological relationship. Um, I'll list a few examples. Um, one is that there's been a massive spike, actually a quadrupling in US imports of Chinese lithium ion batteries in just the last few years, despite an increase in tariffs on these batteries. Um, there's also been a very significant increase in US venture capital investment in Chinese life sciences and biotechnology, even as overall US VC spending in China has declined. And of course, TikTok is just such a marquee invisible example. Its US user base continues to grow, despite all the concerns that parents and policymakers have about it. Now, what else do these three examples, these three bright spots in the relationship show us? I would say it's pretty clear that each of these three examples actually showcases a lot of fragility as well. Um, we've put in place significant industrial policy tools in the form of subsidies to wean um, American companies off of Chinese lithium ion batteries. Um, in the life sciences and biotechnology investment, it, it's been signaled that these are areas where outbound investment restrictions will likely uh, limit US future venture capital investing in the same sector in China. And of course, TikTok is, is probably on the verge of being banned or at least significantly restricted. And so in some ways, these top line figures about continued or sustained or growing US-China technological engagement, I would argue those are really lagging indicators. And the leading indicators are the intellectual and political currents in the United States amongst elite and policy circles. And, and so that's what I kind of want to kind of um, close on. I want to talk about the strategic choices facing the United States, the different camps of perspective about how far this decoupling should go and what the US goal and strategy should be. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about where I think all of this is headed and um, who has the initiative right now. So I think everyone agrees 
that there should be some partial decoupling from China. I think there's virtually no one in the United States that would dispute this. Um, there's probably few people in China that would dispute that this is in some ways an inevitable result of uh, growing uh, geopolitical and geoeconomic tensions. And China has its own interest, I think, in the long term in self-sufficiency, dual circulation and the like. So the real debate is about how far should we go? We've gone a little bit so far. We could also go much, much farther. And so there are what I've described as three camps, three perspectives on this. Uh, the first camp I've called the cooperationists. And basically, this camp is people who believe that the US-China tech relationship is generally non-zero sum and beneficial to the United States. Now, if you've been paying attention so far, you know that this camp has a significantly reduced sway. And I would say virtually um, no vocal adherence in Washington and no real influence. Uh, the constituents of this camp would include the business community, um, but also people who are kind of techno-globalist activists, people who helped create the early internet and are still attached to open science, open technology. Now, these people are basically not listened to today. They've largely been shouted down and a lot of them are self-censoring. So the business community you'd think would be traditionally the most powerful advocate of US-China trade in technology and more broadly um, is pretty quiet on these issues now. I think a lot of major companies are trying to keep their head down and avoiding being hailed before Congress and excoriated for some kind of deal that they're doing with China. The opposite of the cooperationists is what I call the restrictionists. The restrictionists have um, the opposite view uh, that US-China technological engagement is non-zero sum and primarily benefits China. And in particular, this camp tends to perceive a closing window of opportunity, that the longer that we continue engaging deeply and widely with China on technology um, in a variety of areas, the more China gains at our expense. And so there's this sense that if we don't act soon by significantly paring back this relationship, China, we, we may get you know, kind of evanescent advantages like you know, cheap goods, cheap manufacturing, but China is gaining long-term strategic positions that could enable it to dominate technologies and uh, perhaps the global economy or uh, the, the military situation. Um, so there's lots of restrictionists in Washington. Um, I, I would say really this has become the, the, the dominant view. Um, people who are advocating for more and more restrictions, more and more defense, and we can talk about that. In the middle of these two are what I call the centrists. Uh, the centrists, I believe, have a more complicated view. And you know, let me just say, I have to kind of apologize for this. This is kind of just a classic sort of you know, Goldilocks type thing. So obviously, the way I've set it up, centrists are going to be the appealing one, the one that I believe that I'm in. <laughs> Most people in Washington, when I give this spiel, they'll say, oh, yeah, I'm a centrist. Right, yeah, that's great. That's the good one, right? Um, so, but, but let me just like try to def I know, right? Yeah, yeah. Or the third military option presented to the president. Um, so, I think that the key to defining centrism, you know, it, it, it's captured by slogans like "small yard, high fence" or like "tailored approach." But I think the key is accepting that the U.S.-China technology relationship is neither fully zero sum nor fully non zero sum. And it neither entirely advantages the United States nor entirely advantages China. That it's a mixture of all of those things and that this is shifting over time and depends on the specific industry. And again, this is something you can get a lot of people to agree to conceptually, but the question is whether they really have the mindset to apply that and start speaking in terms of risk acceptance and defining areas of what I might sometimes call safe harbor, or I've sometimes heard the phrase green light um, areas where we can positively say that this form of trade, this form of scientific collaboration, this form of technology investment is actually benign, beneficial for the United States, worthy of preservation and even expansion. I think that's kind of the acid test of can you qualify as being a centrist is can you name those things and how many of them can you name? If you look at rhetoric from the US government, uh, you will hear lip service paid to this. And Jake Sullivan has been very explicit in saying, we are implementing small yard high fence. 
But you will much more rarely hear any of the examples that I cited of people actually pointing to positive aspects of the technological and economic relationship that are worthy of sustainment, preservation, and expansion. Uh, Janet Yellen's recent speech was a little better on this, but still rather modest. Um, if you look also at Jake Sullivan's you know, famous speech about small yard high fence, he said, it's a small yard, but the small yard should include the choke points. So that's actually a pretty significant yard if you think about it. And if you think, what are those choke points? Uh, so far, they include microelectronics, advanced semiconductors. Um, in other documents, like the National Security Strategy, the White House has described semiconductors and microelectronics more generally as a foundational technology of the 21st century. So I think it's a quite a significant statement if what, something that we define as a foundational, the foundational technology of the 21st century is also inside the yard. That's a pretty big yard, I would say. And I would also note that US government rhetoric is increasingly pointing to areas as strategic and perhaps needing to be inside this yard that just a couple years ago, people would sometimes cite as areas of possible collaboration with China such as green energy technology, the electric vehicle transition. Increasingly, the administration has become much more explicit in defining advanced batteries, solar, and things of that ilk as clearly being inside the yard. There's a great amount of discomfort on reliance on China there. So uh, where is all of this headed? Um, my view is that the restrictionists have clearly become the dominant camp. When I wrote my report a year ago, I described what I believed as a policy center of gravity between the centrists and the restrictionists. There was a kind of active debate between the two of them. I think that is somewhat um, obsolete now. I think that the restrictionists have taken charge. And you can see this in a variety of ways. Uh, one measure would be that these October 7th export controls on advanced AI chips going to China and on semiconductor manufacturing equipment going to China. Uh, these were by far the most significant moves that have been made so far to decouple and constrain China. Um, and I would argue that they represented a sweep of ambition that has not been made overt so far. Um, in particular, what I mean by that is that the formal justification for these rules was to inhibit Chinese military modernization. But no one would claim that the PLA is anything more than 1% at most of the application of these advanced semiconductors, probably far less than that. It's probably 1% of 1%. So in effect, what we've declared is our willingness to embargo China's development and um, ability to acquire what we believe are foundational technologies that touch everything from medical research, climate research, business innovation, cybersecurity, automated driving, everything for the sake of 1% of 1% of a use case. Now, I think that's quite a significant statement in terms of how we're interpreting this cost-benefit analysis and what it means to say that something is a narrow control. So the ambition is greater than ever. The sweep is greater than ever. <clears throat> and yet at the same time, the bipartisan support for this is greater than ever. Virtually no one criticized these controls. They're widely lauded. And people on both sides of the aisle are rather, rather casually endorsing things that are far more significant. So when I think when I look ahead, I think we're, we're, we're headed toward much more of the same. Um, there is a low decoupling scenario um, in which perhaps we could stabilize at some kind of equilibrium not far from where we are, um, where perhaps what this might look like is uh, we run out of choke points. Right? We, you know, we realize that biotech is not the same as semiconductors. We can't do the same playbook there. Maybe our allies um, get much more uncomfortable with the direction, and there's some kind of come to Jesus moment with our allies where they stand up and say, we're not going to go along with this anymore. Uh, maybe there's an economic crisis. Maybe there's some combination of inflation and recession in the United States that um, creates some sort of grassroots discontent with the prioritization of national security above short-term prosperity. And perhaps you could see a coalition of business groups, trade lobbies, unions, uh, increasingly stand up and oppose these things. But none of that really seems um, like it's on the horizon right now. So I think instead, <clears throat> we will continue on. Uh, we will further decouple. 
Um, and so I think maybe my base case is what I call the kind of moderate decoupling scenario. And, and maybe the moderate decoupling scenario could be described as, as kind of like a shift from um, permanent normal trade relations to more of a case-by-case -case trade relationship, right? Um, so we will see a further expansion of the national security state and its role in the uh, economy um, and in uh, civilian, commercial, and scientific uses and development of technology. Um, and uh, over time, you know, companies that are significantly invested in China, like Apple and Tesla, um, they'll probably cut that by about half, I would think, at least. Um, and uh, we'll see many fewer students coming here. Um, we'll see the walls go up. Um, the IMF and the WTO have projected that you know, the cost of something like this um, could be a couple percentage points of GDP, could be four or five percentage points of GDP. That would be on kind of uh, global, long-run total GDP. Uh, of course, it could be felt more severely um, in certain countries. I think the reason why that's my base case is that I don't see any ballast arising to counterbalance the trends that we're on, the intellectual and political trends that we're on. Uh, I think one way that this base case could come about and that we could end up in a pretty significant decoupling um, is that the US loses control over the process, um, that the Chinese government starts to engage in more tit-for-tat retaliation. Um, and then, of course, that means there will be demand for more of the same in Washington. Um, and also that the business community starts to perceive that it needs to get ahead of the next policy cycle. And so therefore, perception of a future decoupling becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I think that's quite likely. Uh, and then I, I would say the final case is a high decoupling or sort of total divorce scenario. Um, you could imagine, for example, a war over Taiwan creating the ultimate crisis in US-China relations. Um, or perhaps decoupling simply spirals well beyond anyone's control, and we enter what truly could be called a new Cold War in some sense. Um, in this total divorce scenario, you could imagine that the US imposes sweeping sanctions on virtually all trade and transactions with China. Uh, I sometimes uh, use this phrase, soybeans to semiconductor spectrum in terms of like sensitivity, right? So maybe we move from semiconductors actually much closer to soybeans. And I think the, then our allies probably would be initially reluctant to go along with this, even in a Taiwan contingency. But still, there's a sense in which the business community could ultimately deem China to be uninvestable in some ways. And so we could see some kind of total bifurcation. Now, Janet Yellen has said that this would be a disaster for the United States and China. But that does not mean that it won't happen. I don't think it's my base case, but I think it's certainly something conceivable. Um, and I'll just leave with kind of this, this kind of parting shot before we go into Q&A. Um, the US frequently says that we're not seeking a total decoupling or any kind of decoupling. And we hear the same rhetoric from China. I think the better question is, uh, if that's not what we're seeking, what is our vision of a future equilibrium that is beneficial to US interests and also realistically attainable? And based on that vision, what is our pathway for uh, achieving it? I don't think anyone has the answer to that today. Um, but uh, uh, hopefully someone will come up with one. That's my talk. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to keep a list of questions. Uh, Ken, I know you have a class. So I'm going to give you the first question. Uh, but everyone else, please uh, keep your hands up. And we'll do the merry-go-round. So Ken, over to you. John, uh, great talk. And I want to ask a question on short-term and long-term. So looking at the debates that I've seen in Washington and overseas, the emphasis is very heavily on the short-term effects of energy policies. In some areas, China's ahead, in others behind. My problem is that there's very little consideration of long-term effects. And let's go over a couple specific examples, and I really like your thoughts on it. So in areas where China is ahead, for example, BGI, and the cost, they're the world's low cost seeking service of DNA. And we just imposed the licensing requirement. That is very tough. In fact, Americans are going to have a lot of trouble placing orders for hmm. the low cost seeking service of the world. <clears throat> that then places American firms at a disadvantage relative to third parties that will not necessarily be going with those rules. And it doesn't necessarily weaken in any significant sense China's abilities in the area. Counterproductive. In fact. Now, in some areas, China's not ahead. We talk about 
subconductor fabrication and the kind of machinery that they're seeking, they don't have it right now. We're likely to be encouraging Chinese independence from us, more rapid advance. In fact, you could be talking about this as a recipe for techno-industrial policy and rapid autonomous development capabilities. Long term, maybe that policy will backfire as well. The question, in Washington, how much consideration of the long term are you seeing? And in Washington, to what extent do you see serious consideration of third parties as important factors <clears throat> in determining or making these calculations? Uh, great question. And, and I think the time horizon at stake is such a crucial dimension of policymaking that often is not given enough consideration. I, I would just say my view on this is that the longer the time horizon we consider, the less control the United States has over China's technological development, its strength and influence domestically and around the world. Um, China just has a lot of what we might think of as the national endowments to create to become a world leading technology power from um, its population, the size of its economy, um, the technical university system, the innovation ecosystem. I mean, they, they've proven that. Um, so I just think that if we project 20, 30, 40 years out, it's implausible that any arrangement of US policy could really stop that from happening. Um, what we might imagine instead is that we could kind of affect the short-term curve, but end up in the same place. But I think you raise an important question about potential um, backfire effects. And, and there are people who are thinking, for example, about um, if we cut off China's access to this semiconductor manufacturing equipment, are we simply encouraging and catalyzing their own investment in the industry? I'll tell you the co most common response from the policy world on that is that they're doing it anyway, that China is already fully committed to this. And I think this is the subset of the kind of broader hawkish argument that the die is cast, the adversary is already pre-committed to um, its policies, and that therefore we should be in a position of reacting and responding to those. We're not really in a position of influencing them. And if you look to the Biden administration's official rhetoric, you know, there's been an important shift from changing China's behavior to shaping the environment in which China operates. So there's a kind of fatalism that's set in. Which requires third parties cooperating, particularly focusing on environmental conditions. Yes. Not doing all that well for third parties. Yeah, so that's really where some of these short term, long term frictions, I think, hit. Because I think. To give the Biden administration some credit, in the short term, I think they are probably looking at the world with a lot of confidence that they're bringing allies and partners along with us. I mean, these, the October 7th export controls is a great example. You know, people were really troubled that those were unveiled in a unilateral extraterritorial manner. But to the administration's credit, they got Japan and the Netherlands to go along with it. And there's many, many examples of this where I think the administration feels that the, the wind is at their back and allies and partners are coming along. But I think that's a very short-term mindset, right? Because inevitably, if a structure is established whereby we continually impose our will on other countries and force them to go along with it, there will be political backlash at, at the corporate level, at the popular level, and also this fear of designing out US um, components in supply chains. So I, I think that's inevitable. Thanks very much. All right, do you have a two finger? Yeah, this is just on this um, typical um, response. They're doing it anyway. Uh, does anybody ever raise the Clayton Christensen question here? That what you're doing is forcing the Chinese into situations where they have to innovate and they have to work in the areas that are most accessible to them. And uh, you don't know what you don't know. This is the world of unknown unknowns, but you're taking a talented and creative and motivated people and telling them, you know, this is what you can do. And, you know, that's not. You don't know what you're going to get. So I just wonder, does, does anyone ever raise this question? Yeah, I mean, I think part of, part of the zeitgeist, specifically on semiconductors, is that this is such a difficult area to innovate in. That this is the choke point to beat all choke points, especially the manufacturing equipment. There, there's this belief that they can't do anymore, that they won't get there. Now, I think a few things are missed by that. Um, one is the possibility of some kind of future change in the technology paradigm. And I don't know enough about semiconductors to tell you exactly what that is, but I think that's something that people are thinking about, that, you know, um, that 
Moore's Law is kind of running out of steam. People are thinking about future technology paradigms. And China and Chinese scholars talk a lot about, um, uh, I guess, what they call catching up around the bend or like a lane change strategy, um, sort of like taking these paradigm shifting moments. Um, and 5G is a great example of this um, to then actually invest in that. The other huge unintended consequence of these export controls is that by making it in the short to medium term impossible for China to compete at the leading edge and in some of the more advanced semiconductors, we are forcing those companies to double down on their focus on so-called legacy or commodity chips, which is the most profitable and biggest part of the semiconductor marketplace. So already people in DC and in the industry are actually realizing this could create its own kind of competitive threat to the US and Western positions in these other industries. And so a conversation is now already starting about legacy chips and is that a national security or economic security issue? So the slippery slope is just well in motion. Um, I have a question, but so far I'll save it for lunch. <laughs> uh, Kaylee. Hi, I've got um, two questions if you'll permit me. And the first one touches on what you're just talking about now. So I'm curious to what extent do you see the U.S. actions and policies as being driven primarily by specific foreign policy goals versus like an, an industrial policy that is for the purpose of competing in a writ large way. Mm -hmm. And if it is the latter, when was there a shift? Because it seems like, at least on the sanctions side, sanctions are imposed for specific foreign policy goals in mind and will be lifted provided a change in China's behavior. Your comment about Biden's quote um, it got me also thinking on this point, and maybe there has been a shift, but I'm wondering the extent to which there are actions taken on specific foreign policy goals versus this is a writ large change in competing wholesale with China right. along all these dimensions. And maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Um, my second question has to do with allies, but I'll maybe say that. Okay, one. yeah, just try to keep one question in my head at the same time, so I appreciate it. Um, I think there's been an important shift along the lines that you describe. Um, so ZTE, the uh, Chinese telecommunications giant, um, this was one of the first and most powerful uses of the entity list, initially under the Obama administration, and then it kind of went off and went on again and then went off. That was a targeted action based on specific things that ZTE was doing to violate sanctions against Iran and North Korea. It was understood as a targeted action. And therefore, when ZTE came to the table and basically offered a negotiated settlement of the issue and said, we're going to impose new kind of compliance measures. That was removed, right? We're no longer in that world. Um, Huawei has not been given any path to remove the entity list designation. And with these October 7th export controls, I think it, it's just very important to note that there was no conditionality on these. There was no statement of the terms of negotiation and what China could do to remove some of these. So I think there's been an important shift there. I think we've moved from an era in which we have these kind of set of individualized grievances with China and friction points to more a sense of the grievances are so broad, so deep, and so intractable that ultimately the problem is China's power. And that therefore we will be taking action to limit China's power, and that centrally includes technological development. Now, again, everything I'm saying is officially heresy, and the administration strongly disclaims that that's their goal. But I think it's clear that there are at least powerful factions in government and policymaking who would privately endorse what I'm saying, and others whose views are kind of tantamount to that, or they would go along with it. When did you put time on when that shift happened? There's so many different kind of pivot points or key moments. Um, I think one thing, like a, a date that I sometimes cite is the 2015-2016 timeframe. Um, so I spent a lot of time looking at cyber issues. And so a really interesting historical event for me was President Obama's meeting with Xi Jinping and the arrangement that they came up to on um, cyber-enabled theft of commercial trade secrets. That was kind of a moment where there was still a fork in the road on tech issues with China, where Obama could, in effect, communicate to China that you've got two paths in front of you. You've got one path where there will be increased sanctions and pressure because we can't take this anymore, but you've also got another path in which there won't be. 
And if we could come to some kind of workable arrangement between the two of us, a negotiated solution could allow the continued sustainment and growth of US-China ties. That just isn't the case today. We couldn't have a similar arrangement, and there aren't talks on even bigger issues like the Trump tariffs. There's just no active negotiations on those, which I think is kind of a remarkable statement. Um, the other thing that happened around that time was this shift um, intellectually. Um, so, you know, Ash Carter, when he was defense secretary, kind of de de debuted this phrase, the return of great power competition, which of course also includes Russia. And I think what people sometimes forget is that there was initial discomfort with that in the White House, and this was reported at the time, that the Obama White House actually said, don't use that phrase because it seems to predetermine the relationship. And so my sense is 2015, 2016 was this kind of um, f moment of ferment where these ideas were shifting, but there wasn't yet consensus. Uh, when the Trump administration came in, I think things have shifted enough intellectually that then if you look at the national defense strategy and the national security strategy and everything that Trump did um, at an administrative level, although often not in his personal views, I think the shift had been cemented. So, okay, do you want to, I have a follow-on actually, um, so I won't restrain myself. It, it, it seems, and I guess I'm just wondering if this is your view, I think it is, but it, it seems like taking the October 7th decision um, and all these shifts, right, that the goal is simply to balance Chinese power, right? And looking at all future sources of economic growth are the most robust ones and, and focusing on those. And so the military thing, right, that could be an issue 15 years from now if AI is progressed enough such that like it, it could be deployed with those chips. But I'm guessing a lot of the chips in current Chinese equipment are all legacy chips, you know, of one stripe or another. And so, so I guess, like, do you agree with that characterization? Then why do you think the administration goes to such great pains to provide the alternative characterization, right? Uh, is it to, um, you know, force China to lash out and thus justify the policy? Yeah. Is it to uh, ma maintain sort of good ties with allies? Sorry, Keely, I'm anticipating your question, perhaps, um, you know, other, other messaging sort of reasons, um, because it doesn't seem by the nature of the action that they would really like believe Excuse that. Me. Huh. Um, I, I roughly agree with that, um, with the caveat that policymaking, of course, is about coalitional politics, um, not only within Congress, but also within the interagency. And that what, what I've seen is the development of a very robust coalition supporting this policy, but sometimes with different views, right? So not everyone would, like, even in their heart of hearts, kind of sign up to what you just said but they might go along with it for some other reason. Um, so for example, there's people in the Democratic Party who believe that um, hyping the Chinese threat in some way, and, and they don't think that they're hyping it, but that, that this could um, unlock gridlock in Washington and enable investments in you know, our education system, industrial policy, fighting climate, right? So that this is kind of a powerful tool for accomplishing other much needed objectives um, there are others, I think, who would just fully agree privately with, with what you just said. Um, and then I think there's a third category of people, and honestly, this may be the majority, and, and I'll just do some psychoanalysis here, people who genuinely believe that they're not pursuing a path of containment, or, um, but, but that in effect are doing that, and I think are kind of self-deluding by not defining stopping points or limiting principles or thinking about the end game or the ways that other actors might respond. Um, so then your second question was, why are we seeing this more cautious and moderate rhetoric that's different from the true direction of policy? I think there's a few interesting reasons for that, a lot of which have to do with uh, um, domestic and international law and diplomacy. Um, so on export controls, for example, the U.S. export control system is very open-ended, and we can pretty much export control for almost any reason. But our partners are not in that same position. Our, our U.S. is actually kind of unique in this respect. Uh, most other countries that we deal with have a law that limits their export controls to things that are uh, controlled under multilateral regimes, such as Wassenaar, which um, is focused on uh, dual-use material with military applications. Um, 
or that have some other very specific military valence and often uh, weapons of mass destruction specific. And so that's a big reason why if you read the Federal Register on these October 7th export controls, they go to elaborate pains to describe how these AI chips could ultimately be used in the development of, of, uh, of nuclear weapons by modeling explosions and missile aerodynamics and things like that. It's a pretty thin read from my perspective, but this provides a fig leaf for Japan and the Dutch to act. Um, and I think it's widely understood that both of those countries are acting at the outer edges of their legal authority. Um, and so this was in some ways a necessary salve. I think the other legal regime that I think is really interesting to think about here is the WTO. Um, under the WTO kind of framework and GAD and everything else that comes with it, you're not allowed to just restrict stuff just because or just because you think that there's economic competition from a country. Um, often what the US cites is a very capacious interpretation of this Article 21, which allows uh, so-called national security exception. Um, now, even there, the US interpretation of Article 21 is far beyond what most other countries in the WTO appellate panel itself seems to suggest um, is the kind of consensus interpretation on that. Um, but so putting something under this national security banner enables us to say that we're acting consistent with the WTO framework. And you know, there's other reasons as well, but I think I'll stop there. Great, thanks. Um, oh, so there's a two finger on that because Kaylee's got her yeah, second. So, John, great talk. And for this last five minutes, I've been thinking about U.S. sanctions against Iraq in the interwar mm -hmm. period and a shift from sanctions that were meant to coerce to sanctions that were meant to contain. Mm -hmm. And you hit on one aspect, this last bit you were talking about, international allied pressure to have this, I wouldn't say quite a facade at this point, but definitely in the past. The other part you haven't talked about as much, at least I haven't heard, is uh, internal domestic pressure within the U.S. Mm -hmm. We saw in the 90s, the Republican Party used this issue as a wedge issue against the Clinton administration, who ultimately Clinton signed uh, up as uh, Iraqi re regime change, official U.S. policy. Are you seeing anything similar to that, or is the Democratic and Republican Party's policy so similar that you, they can't get mm -hmm. leverage? That's a great question. Um, I mean, it's often stated that there's bipartisan consensus on these issues, and I think that's true, but that also obscures this kind of secondary dynamic whereby the Republicans are still pushing harder and more sharply and view it as a political advantage. And so therefore, the Democrats kind of have this flank effect that they need to respond to. Um, so I think both things are, are at stake. Um, I'll just give you some example of kind of bipartisan support for this on the Democratic side. Examples that to me have been sort of striking and indicative. Um, one is on this issue of uh, the SDN list. Um, and you know, for folks who don't follow this closely, the SDN list is like the nuclear bomb of US sanctions. And it really has not been used against China in any significant way, certainly not against major Chinese tech companies. Um, there's discussion of, of uncorking this tool and using it against um, major companies, uh, particularly Hike Vision, the surveillance manufacturer, uh, but also potentially Huawei and others. Um, so Chuck Schumer recently uh, co-sponsored legislation to put Hike Vision on the SDN list. This would be a remarkable escalation that would have huge impact on third countries because, of course, the functionality of the SDN list is by preventing dollar-denominated transactions. And so it would, in essence, be forcing any country that has ties to the U.S. financial system not to work with Huawei. It would be quite coercive. So I found that remarkable that that was kind of Chuck Schumer's stance on this. Um, TikTok is another interesting example. There's just huge bipartisan support for controlling and restricting TikTok. And, and, and so I, I, I thought kind of um, bellwethers, uh, there were a couple pieces by Ezra Klein and Matt Iglesias, who I kind of view as like, you know, just sort of like, you know, leading proponents of kind of liberal intelligentsia, kind of general policy analysis, people who don't focus necessarily on tech issues, but are just kind of like generally informed commentators on the left. Um, they both uh, wrote this spring that TikTok should be banned. Um, and in both cases, they really did not have a very deep analysis of it. Um, I, I wrote a piece critiquing the Hike Vision proposals to put Hike Vision on the SDN list. The Washington Post editorial board um, uh, editorialized in favor of putting Hike Vision on the SDN list. Now, they cited my piece and they said, you know, some commentators worry that. You know, this could create an unstoppable decoupling that we couldn't control, and that's a legitimate concern. 
And then the last line of the piece, it just said, but that shouldn't be too hard to stop. And then it just stopped there. So I think there's, there's significant bipartisan kind of interest in this. Um, but then there still is this competitive dynamic. Um, I remember during the transition when uh, after the election, but before Biden had been sworn in, and Biden was starting to list some of his national security picks for Secretary of State, et cetera. And Marco Rubio and Josh Hawley and others who were thought to have presidential aspirations immediately went for the China issue and said, this is a team that will surrender to China. This is a team that's going to manage our decline with China. Um, so I think this is a very explosive issue. Now, so far, the Biden administration has been pushing so hard in many respects that it hasn't been that vulnerable. But the minute they stop and, you know, basically, if you stop the bicycle, the whole thing falls apart, right? Like, if they don't ban TikTok and the time is ticking on that, then the political um, dynamics will immediately flip. You know, if the Biden administration comes out and says, we've come to a negotiated arrangement with TikTok that won't result in a ban, but we'll have these mitigations for data security and the like, all of a sudden the Biden administration will then have to be in a position of defending TikTok's continued presence in the United States. So that will be a kind of major pivot point in the politics of this, and I'm not sure they're prepared for that. Um, Zach Fredette. Hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious for you to elaborate a little bit on the criteria that you would use from your centrist position to figure out where exactly to build the fence and the, the, the small yard high fence uh, approach. It seems like one criteria that you identified as possible one is choke points, uh, but then there's the dilemma that you identified that if you, if you take the premise that the, there are dual use technologies that are important to military power, but also foundational to the civilian economy, it seems like restricting those ends up looking pretty restrictionist. Another one you identified, I think, in the report, but not here, is windows of opportunity to, to prevent China from taking a technological lead. Uh, how do you know a window when you see one? How do you know when it closes? Are there other criteria we should be thinking about? It seems like this is a very cool, it's kind of like a Kanye thing. Of a, I'm very intrigued and provoked by this concept, but I don't actually know kind of what it means when people like Jake Sullivan talk about it. Yeah. I'm curious. <laughs> Great question. Um, I can't give you a very satisfying answer kind of verbally. I will say um, the second half of my report is, a, is a, my best attempt to answer that question. So I laid out those nine U.S. policy objectives from maintaining a military edge to countering authoritarianism and so on. And basically the second half of the report kind of goes chapter by chapter through each objective, um, does some cost-benefit weighing, and suggests particular lines that we could draw and how those could be administratively performed by different agencies, and also gives examples. Um, I think when I wrote the report, I actually had the aspiration of like, oh, like somebody could just pick this up and implement it. Um, and I don't think it really works that way, but, but I think what I was trying to do is avoid this trap of vagueness to where it's not clear what I'm arguing for. So I tried to kind of um, basically put myself on the line a little bit and say like, we don't need to ban TikTok, for example. So I, I give specific examples along those lines. Um, so I would just encourage you to read those and, and kind of judge me for that. And part of that is kind of an invitation for others to, to, to do the same, to actually describe the limiting principles and the lines and the stopping points. Since you asked about military issues, I'll, I'll, I'll just give kind of brief summary of what I advocate there. And we're in this age where most of the significant emerging commercial technologies have some kind of military application. Artificial intelligence is the ultimate example of this. But also, it's unclear exactly what those applications look like. Um, and as we've already talked about, I think they're, they're definitely over the horizon. Um, so what I'm looking for is just, in some ways, more of a story from DOD. I want DOD to come out and say, first of all, just say, AI is, you know, is, is not going to be decisive in any kind of US-China conflict for the following X years, right? Maybe that's like, say, five years. I think we could just confidently say that in the next five years. Now, is there a date by which we're less sure about that? What is that date? And then I want a story about the specific applications of AI in a military conflict that we believe could be the most decisive. Is it sensing? Is it you know, uh, you know, automated piloting of drones? You know, what is it? And when you tell that story, then you become subject to analysis and critique about how exactly do we see a U.S.-China-Taiwan conflict playing out. I mean, in, in all of the stuff that I've read, um, it's probably just going to be pretty traditional factors. Um, the will and capability of the Taiwanese populace to resist, um, the amount of kind of low-grade capabilities that they might have to slow a Chinese advance and create time for the U.S. to get there, our political will to respond, 
the initial air battle, the ability of China to mount a complex joint amphibious operation on a scale that you know hasn't been done in decades and that it's never done before. I mean, so it's easy to just kind of sprinkle this AI pixie dust over it and say, well, AI is transformational. You know, all of this will be impacted with AI. I think you really need to tell a more rigorous story if the ultimate end state is this kind of sweeping, unprecedented embargo on the foundational technology of the future. I, I don't think we've proven that out. I don't think people feel the burden to prove that out. Um, so that's kind of where I think things should go. Um, Maria, finger. Sorry, can I just push you on this uh, precise point? As far as I understand, the thing about technology is that we don't actually know how it develops or what its development will look like. So in order to be able to tell the kind of story that you're asking for, we would need to have a lot more knowledge about what the future looks like, which we can't have because we don't have crystal ball. So sort of how do you square those two things away? No, you're absolutely right about that. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is like, we have so far to go before we hit the limit of kind of the robustness of the analysis that could be done with our contemporary understanding, in my view. I mean, if you look at the um, official and unofficial discussion of the October 7th export controls, I, I would just say there's, there's just literally no attempt, none, none, to define what the AI applications could be and how they could be important. So I think we have to do better than that if we're going to do something so significant. I mean, it's, it's kind of like your classic sort of like, the more significant the control, the more serious our analysis should be about some effort at future projection. And I think this is a normal part of any kind of administrative regulatory process around something like export controls. You always go through this analysis. But unfortunately, when the political environment has become so fevered and when a zeitgeist has been developed that has become so powerful, um, I think analysts stop attempting to run those traps. Um, I think the other thing that I would say in response to that, and again, it's a very important and true point, is that's also true for the other perspective. Um, we also don't know the downside risks of all of these export controls and visa limits. So there's lots of possibilities um, on the negative side for uh, precipitous decoupling and how that could even impact our military, right? If we do things that, for example, limit um, H-1B V H one B um, uh, Chinese citizens getting access to H-1B visas or OPT or other things that make it harder for them to then work in the U.S. tech sector. Maybe then that slows down the same companies that DOD, the other side of its mouth, describes as our national security innovation base. Um, so I think there's risks on both sides. And I guess I would just say simply that we went through a long period where the risks of technological integration with China were kind of submerged and not seriously considered. Now the pendulum has swung so far in the other direction, I'm trying to get us back toward a middle where there's a political and intellectual atmosphere that enables both to be considered. Speaking of Taiwan, uh, Eric Higginbotham. Thanks, John, that's terrific. Um, and if I know anything about the DOD, you're not gonna get that statement. I can't remember when the last time the DOD stipulated something would not be for <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I wanted to ask you about uh, uh, extraterritoriality and secondary sanctions, but we've got a little bit beyond that, so I'll just probe a little bit farther. You mentioned the, the sort of uh, half-life on these or the possibility their allies ultimately will push back if we proceed with this. I, I'm curious what that pushback would look like. Um, mm -hmm. We need to go sort of farther than we already have in order for that to happen. Would they just simply call our bluff? So what would that uh, look like? And then maybe uh, on the additional questions, a little bit broader, but, uh, you know, we are getting, we're hearing a lot of complaints already, right? So the Japanese are screaming, Koreans are screaming uh, about legality and about mm. the impact on their interests and about the unpredictable business environment that we're sort of creating here. And I am curious whether both these extraterritorial, extraterritorial applications and our, and our own domestic measures whether that's a feature and not a bug, in other words, whether the folks who want decoupling are sort of counting on this unpredictability to do mm. a lot of their heavy lifting for them. Yeah. It's a really incisive point, and I think there's something to that. Um, you know, when I'm describing how I'm characterizing a scenario where the U.S. could lose control of the decoupling process by creating a self-fulfilling prophecy in which companies and other actors feel that they need to act first. 
And when I describe that, I'm describing it as a negative because we would, I think we would like to just draw the lines wherever we would like to draw them. I think there are some who view that as a positive, um, that by taking a targeted action, we could um, catalyze and encourage others to like ripple well beyond that. So I, so I think some do view it as a feature and not a bug. Now, wh wh what's the breaking point with allies? Obviously, it's very difficult to predict. Um, a few things that I've observed so far that I found really interesting. One is going back to this offense-defense distinction. It seems to me that U.S. allies have been far more vocal and obstreperous in their um, opposition to U.S. industrial policy and subsidies than to the unilateral extraterritorial use of restrictive tools like export control. So I found that to be striking. Maybe um, they feel that uh, whatever oxes are being gored have more to do in some ways with a supercharged U.S. competitive threat um, than with the, um, the China relationship being curtailed in what at least you could tell a story for now as being like narrow ways. So I think that's quite interesting, but also I think there's an interactive effect there, right? Like these unilateral export controls do not make it any easier to smooth over something like the Inflation Reduction Act with its discriminatory tax credits. Ultimately, when we hear the language of friendshoring, we're almost envisioning a re-architecting of trade and investment relationships that will involve a ton of diplomacy and, and politics. And so I would just hope that we would not do things to just make, that, make those conversations harder, um, I, I guess is my, my kind of overall take on that. Um, yeah, I, but I don't know where the breaking point is. Sam Leiter. I didn't have my answer. <laughs> <laughs> I ask, I ask, ask a question one. now. You have the opportunity. Have one, one. Still not Sorry. Quite working hard. No, no. So, right, Smith? Did you have your hand up? Oh, good, good. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I wanted to ask about this. Uh, you made a bit of an offhanded comment kind of near the end about um, how there Potentially, there could be pushback from sort of economic actors who would want, who would oppose decoupling. And I guess I'm curious if you could unpack that a bit, because as I look at it, the, the quote unquote business community was probably pretty divided on this topic, actually, right? There's a lot of businesses that stand to really benefit from an industrial policy of reshoring. And I think my sense is I, I don't see any union act that would step forward to support trade with China because they never have and it's never been in their interest to do so. So I think the business community that supports kind of the ongoing engagement is small and probably shrinking compared to the segment that is going to be probably more influential in opposition to it. So I was just wondering what your assessment of that was. You're right. And I don't, I don't want to generalize the business community is so diverse. Um, there are even, you know, companies I always use Palantir as an example that are like really strongly pushing decoupling and are excoriating their competitors for their involvement in China. So there are companies that benefit from this. Certainly if we're talking about industrial policy, I mean, that's free money, right? So I think there's a distinction there between the stick and the carrot. The carrot is obviously favored, but increasingly these things are being joined, right? So in order to access the massive chip fabrication subsidies in the Chips and Science Act, you need to agree to not materially expand your China operations for a 10-year period. So there's a linkage there and maybe a belief in Washington that the more money we hand out, the more freedom that we have to act in these more restrictive and coercive areas. Um, but I do think that you're right that you know an important truth here is that many in the business community have their own... Um, you know, jaundiced eyed view of the business operation environment in China, um, the dynamic zero COVID, you know, the kind of tech clash that Xi Jinping has been overseeing. I mean, the list goes on. Um, so it is complicated, but I think also there is some fear as far as how things could go. I mean, I've spoken to companies, important companies in the US, Asia and elsewhere, that have basically told me that uh, decoupling is an existential threat to them and that they could cease to exist in some future scenarios. Um, you could imagine, for example, uh, we talked about the distinction between leading edge chips and legacy chips. Well, if the export controls come for the legacy chips, that's a very different situation. Um, 
in some ways, and this actually gets back to the previous question about the, bre the breaking point with allies, the breaking point with corporates. Um, you all will be familiar with the term salami slicing, which is something we often accuse China of doing. You could argue that the U.S. has been brilliantly salami slicing both of these constituencies by moving drip by drip. With the October 7th export controls, we targeted a strategic sector, but really it was primarily a sector of future growth, not of major current revenue for the broad swath of the semiconductor industry. Um, that could change in the future, right? Um, so I think if that changes, um, you could see some kind of breaking point. I think ultimately what, what I'd like to see is some kind of cross-industry coalition of companies that are especially exposed to this um, to kind of at least be a repository of information and useful, um, uh, uh, useful kind of helpful pushback in this zeitgeist. Um, but it's been striking that this hasn't happened. And you know, I think a really striking example is the tariffs. Um, the tariffs had such a significant economic impact on so many companies. And yet there really was never a major political movement against them. There was a kind of moment maybe a year or two ago where it seemed like Biden could do something about them. Uh, inflation was at its peak. People were arguing that the tariffs were inflationary. This was understood to be the biggest Democratic Party liability going into the midterms was inflation. Ultimately, they decided that the China issue mattered more and they didn't act. And I think the window has gone. <coughs> Great. So um, due to my poor list management, I have three people left. I've got about three minutes. So what I'm going to do is speed dating round. I'm going to ask great. all three of them to ask their questions. Uh, I'll try to be more succinct. They will <laughs> ask, and their questions in turn will be succinct. Um, <laughs> so let's just go uh, what I believe is the three, Suzanne, Diana, and Jim. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I think sort of sitting at a major STEM university in the U.S., I think especially with local news stories here, especially in March, about uh, faculty in the en in engineering departments having been briefed by the FBI about Chinese students in their labs and other foreign students. Um, how do, what do you think the future of U.S. policy should look like towards foreign students, sort of, that there is a need to strike the balance between uh, avoiding a freeze, sort of meeting national security needs, and avoiding what could be larger xenophobia. Um, and it doesn't seem like outsourcing this to university professors is necessarily the best policy at the time. Right. Thank you. I think outsourcing to university. Thank you for the talk. Uh, my question in very brief um, form is why China? Right, like ha there have been other countries um, that are that have similar uh, techn technological capacity on par with the U.S. Um, there are sectors where uh, other countries are on par and even surpass the U.S. Um, have there been cases in the past or similar cases where the U.S. has dealt differently um, with uh, in in terms of technological competition policies um, than the case in China? Uh, thank you for the talk. You rightly anticipate an uh, analyst. Uh, allergy to the Goldilocks three choices, and you try to kill that in advance by saying, uh, well, we'll have metrics of sort of the number and severity of the, of the restrictions that people sign on to. And then my question is, then to press you, uh, you maybe you have it, you didn't have a chance to present it, then it would seem to me at that rhetorical level, the problem is still there, but if you were to specify what the list was and code it by its severity, then you'd have some basis, empirical basis, for establishing whether someone was in the middle, which will doubtless grow in size, or whether it's uh, something else entirely. Great. Ah, oh, man, such rich questions. And I've already talked so much that I haven't created time for robust answers. Um, so uh, let, me, let me go in reverse order if I could. Um, metrics for centrism. You know, when I was writing this report, I, I thought I should just throw out a figure, just notionally, just to provoke people. You know, so in my early drafts, I said, like, probably 90% of technological engagement defined on a variety of different metrics is safe. Maybe 10% isn't. Maybe that's what a centrist is. A lot of people reading the draft critiqued it. They said, we, we can't tell what it means. It's unclear. I think I ended up taking it out. But interestingly, um, the European Union um, head of trade policy, Savina Veyant, she recently made a remark that said that they've done their own analysis at the EU level of China-EU trade, and they, they have determined that 94% is safe. Now, 
What does that mean? Who knows? We haven't seen that analysis. But no U.S. figure has or would say make any remark like that because it's just too. It sounds it's, the figure just sounds too high. Uh, no one is willing to give a figure, and so instead you have people like Janet Yellen and um, uh, and Tony Blinken and others who give these speeches and they say, "Hey, we're not for decoupling. You know, we want a nice economic relationship." but they never really say what that looks like. Um, so I think that says a lot about this, the distinctions between the two. Um, why, uh, why, why, why China? Are there historical precedents? There are at least two historical precedents that, that I've thought about, Japan and the Soviet Union. This is not the first era of techno-nationalism in the United States. Um, you could think about it across different strata of US history. I think in the last century, there were two previous eras where actually a lot of the initial architecture of technological defense was constructed. Um, and that was um, during the Cold War and then with the rise of uh, Japan as an economic competitive threat in the 80s and the 90s. Um, I think in some ways, China represents the agglomeration of both of these threats. Soviet Union was primarily a national security threat, but not primarily an economic threat. And Japan was the inverse of that. Um, and Ultimately, China seems to represent both of those at once and seemingly in a more enduring form. And so I think that's really catalyzed interest in doing more than we did before. Uh, one could also make the case that um, maybe the threat perceptions in these two prior eras, particularly with regard to Japan, was overblown and that some of the U.S. policy and rhetoric about, China, about Japan was cresting um, just as the Japanese bubble was about to pop and they entered a 30 to 40 year um, period of stagnation. Um, so it is interesting to think about how, how much we can overestimate these things. The Soviet Union too, obviously, the Soviet Union was a, a, an enormous threat to us on, on every conceivable dimension. But you know, the CIA and others massively overestimated the size of the Soviet economy, sometimes by two, three, four times, um, and we didn't predict their ultimate collapse. So I think there's some interesting lessons there. Um, okay, I saved the hardest question for last, which is about um, how to strike the balance on US policy toward foreign students. Um, I don't have a great answer on this, but I would say some ways that we could improve. Uh, right now, the civil military fusion policy applies at when the Chinese student or researcher has an affiliation at the level of a university, right? Th that seems like too high a unit of analysis to determine whether that student has some kind of link to China's military fusion uh, program. To simply say that they're in a program or in a university regardless of their work or their program's connection to any military civil fusion, if that makes sense. It's just too high, um, too high a unit of analysis. So I would, I would move the unit of analysis below that. Um, and I think I would also offer perhaps more clarity, and maybe this is happening internally on the specific fields of study that are considered relevant to military civil fusion. Um, I don't think that's been disclosed. And um, I understand why. There's tremendous desire in the national security state to be secretive about detailed criteria for decision in that this could be exploited by the adversary and you want to attain um, room for maneuver. Um, but I think it would be beneficial to have more clarity on these things. And maybe I'll just close with this thought. Um, there are lots of habits of mind and habits of policymaking that aren't going to serve us well in a new era where national security is such an, a larger and larger concept that touches so much beyond its traditional ambit. And so one of those habits of mind is let's have a bunch of super secret detailed criteria that we don't share with the public and we'll make decisions on a case by case basis to maintain maximum um, autonomy politically and internationally. That's a habit of mind that runs really deep and that you see suffused through all of this policy. I don't think it will serve us well in the future. I think some clarity will serve us well. Great. Well, on that note, John, thanks so much for a terrific talk. It was great to have you here today. And uh, you really closed us out for the bang. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.